on World News Tonight. Overcoming divisions. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi urges the leaders of the world to stop funding wars and look for solutions. Building ties. In a shock move to the west, head of the state of Russian ally Belarus makes a surprise visit to Beijing. Poking the dragon. The Russian Federation shoots down Ukrainian drones in the Russian territory of Crimea in a rare attack on Russia. And Alaska's aurora. The heaven opens up in Alaska as stunning displays of auroras decorate the night sky. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers watching other there in the world news tonight. Now we have a number of comprehensive coverages lined up for you tonight from neighboring India and across the globe. Leading tonight on our bulletin is the G20 summit currently ongoing in New Delhi. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has urged G20 foreign ministers to overcome their divisions and focus on the needs of the developing world. He told the ministers in Delhi that they are meeting at a time of deep global divisions and that they have a responsibility to those not in this room. It was evident from Prime Minister Modi's speech today that India wanted to deliver agreements that could help the developing world and fuel its global ambitions. Prime Minister Modi called on the delegates to take it to heart and focus on issues that unite them. Today's schedule included sessions on food security, development, cooperation, terrorism and humanitarian assistance, a reflection of India's priorities while it holds the G20 presidency. India will hope to mediate in what is likely to be a fractious meeting and make some progress towards a consensus on less politically contentious issues. But with Russia and the United States expected to hold press conferences after the meeting, it's likely that divisions over Ukraine will leave a lasting impression. Foreign ministers, including Russia's Sergei Lavrov, the United States' Antony Blinken and China's Xing Yang, are in Delhi for the meeting. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken attends the meeting following his discussions with the leaders in Central Asia as Washington pursued deeper engagement with the region's former Soviet republics in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine a year ago. Meanwhile, Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni also arrived in Delhi this morning on a two-day state visit in the first bilateral VVIP visit from Italy to India after five years. She will be the chief guest and keynote speaker at the 8th Raisina Dialogue. Experts say Delhi will have the delegate task of following its non-alignment policy over the war while urging other nations to find ways to work together. For the second day in a row, China dismissed U.S. suggestions that the COVID-19 pandemic may have been triggered by a virus that leaked from the Chinese laboratory. Foreign Minister Spokeswoman Mao Ning said that the involvement of the United States intelligence community was evidence enough of the politicization of COVID tracing. Yes, I China's government is dismissing new allegations from the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, that the coronavirus pandemic originated in a Wuhan laboratory. A spokesperson said it has, quote, no credibility whatsoever. Ray's claim, the latest in a string of similar statements by American officials going back years to the Trump administration, underlines splits in opinion even inside the current U.S. government including the Biden White House. Ray made the comments in an interview with Fox News on Tuesday. He said that the FBI had come to the Wuhan lab conclusion for quite some time, but said he couldn't share many details because it was classified. And that followed a weekend report by the Wall Street Journal that the Department of Energy had come to the same conclusion, although that agency reportedly had low confidence in its assessment. This is not an opinion shared uniformly across the government. At least four other agencies and a national intelligence panel have said the pandemic likely had natural origins. Two others are undecided. John, on the... Um, this was White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby on Monday. There is not a consensus right now in the U.S. government about exactly how COVID started. That work is still ongoing. Ray became FBI director in 2017 after he was appointed by then-President Trump, who shared his belief in the Wuhan theory. China's government has always denied it. On Wednesday, its foreign ministry called it political manipulation 
and that the U.S. intelligence community had, quote, a poor track record of fraud and deception. China seems to be making progress both diplomatically and economically as China's factory activity for February bounced further into expansion territory. The official manufacturing purchase managers index rose to 52.6 in February, above the 50-point mark that separates growth from contraction. That makes the highest reading since April 2012 when it hit 53.5. Chinese factories are roaring back into life as the country's economy reopens. Figures out Wednesday zoomed past expectations. The closely watched Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index hit 52.6 in February. That's its highest in over a decade, with any number above 50 pointing to expanding activity. A private sector survey also showed activity rising for the first time in seven months. Economists hope the country's rebound from lockdowns will now help underpin global growth too. The International Monetary Fund last month raised its forecasts for the world economy, in part because of China's exit from health crisis restrictions. So far, it's a weaker picture in the rest of Asia though. Japan's final PMI for February fell, dropping at the fastest pace in more than two years. The weak outcome followed a slump in output of cars and chips, casting doubt on the Bank of Japan's view that a steady recovery was underway. Factory activity also shrank in Taiwan and Malaysia, while India saw manufacturing expand at its slowest pace in four months. South Korea saw its exports fall for a fifth month, hit by a plunge in shipments of semiconductors. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been asked to vacate their UK residence. Reports have claimed that the move which removes their final remaining foothold in the United Kingdom was sanctioned by the King. It comes weeks after the Duke of Sussex's book Spare was released, which revealed deep rifts between him and the rest of the royal family. Harry and Meghan have rarely returned to Britain since their departure of the United States, but have used Frogmore on the few occasions that they have been back, such as for celebrations for the late Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee last year. Relations between the couple and the rest of the family have become even more strained since then. The disagreements have cast major doubts on whether Harry will attend his father's coronation in May. It has been reported that the house has been offered by the monarch to his brother, Prince Andrew. Buckingham Palace said that it would not comment on the report. A royal source said that any such discussions would be a private family matter. We now have yet more concerning updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict as Ukraine flew a deadly wave of drones deep into Russia's territory, with one almost reaching Moscow in a move that shook the Kremlin. Drones struck several regions in western Russia, although damage was minimal. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered officials to tighten control of the Ukraine border in response to this rare attack on the Russian territory. According to the Russian Defense Ministry on Wednesday, an attempt by Ukraine to carry out a massive drone attack on the Crimean Peninsula has been prevented. It said that out of a total of 10 drones, six were shot down, while four were disabled. The latest statement comes after the Kremlin earlier this week claimed that a number of drones had been sent deep inside Russia, including near the capital. Russian authorities on Tuesday also reported several drone attacks in regions bordering Ukraine. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko for talks on Wednesday. China and Belarus are two of the few close allies of Russia. The leaders held face-to-face -face talks for the first time since September 2022. The meeting also comes as Ukraine's Western allies fear that China will eventually come to the assistance of Russia, which is currently seeing its military arsenal depleted after over a year of war with Ukraine. However, according to a Chinese readout of the meeting held between the two leaders, China remains firm that it is a neutral party in the conflict, adding that Beijing's core position is promoting peace and diplomacy. Meanwhile, the official statement from China also noted that President Lukashenko and the Belarusian government agree with and support China's stance and proposition on a political solution to the Ukrainian crisis, which is significant to resolving the crisis. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the U.S. Treasury Department imposed sanction on three companies and two individuals for illicitly generating income for the North Korean government. The sanctions come after months of internationally condemned missile launches by Pyongyang, the most recent of which took place last month. The U.S. has taken more action against those supporting North Korea's illicit behavior. The Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, on Wednesday sanctioned three companies and two individuals for illicitly generating income for the North Korean government. Under Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence Brian Nelson emphasized the U.S. commitment to targeting the regime's illicit networks that help fund its destabilizing activities such as its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs. The sanctioned companies include Chisong Trading Corporation and Korea Peko Trading Corporation. The department said that these companies have generated funds for the North Korean government. OFAC also sanctioned two people, Hwang Gil-su and Park Hwa-sung. The two are accused of establishing Congo Akon Saral in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to earn revenue from construction and statue-building projects. Their commercial activities are suspected to have generated income for the DPRK regime. The sanctioned entities will have their transactions and properties blocked and individuals will be denied entry into the U.S. In a separate statement, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that Wednesday's action further aligns U.S. sanctions with our international partners and that the United States is committed to countering North Korea's efforts to generate revenue for its weapons programs. This follows North Korea's strategic cruise missile test last week and ICBM test launch last month. And on a somber update on the gruesome train wreck in Greece, protests have erupted over the rail crash which killed 43 people, with many seeing it as an incident that had been waiting to happen. A station master has been arrested following a train crash, and the police statement identified the suspect only as a 59-year-old man and did not release his name yet. Another two people have been detained for questionnaire. Greek police clashed with around a thousand protesters outside a branch of the country's rail network a day after 38 people were killed when two trains collided head-on north of Athens. Some hurled stones at windows of the offices of Hellenic Train, and police in riot gear dispersed them with tear gas. Earlier in the evening, things had been more peaceful with a candlelight vigil nearby. <laughs> The students have gathered here outside the office with a lot of rage, said one protester, shocked by what happened today where so many lives and souls were lost. Hellenic Train said it had suspended all trains scheduled to run Thursday after railway workers said they would strike. Their union said that repeated calls for more permanent staff, training and modern security technology had been ignored. A station master has been arrested in the wake of a crash passengers described as nightmarish that engulfed their train in flames just before Tuesday at midnight. Authorities are trying to work out how the two trains collided. They say they'd been on the same track for many kilometers. A police official says the 59-year-old station master has denied any responsibility for the crash, attributing it to a possible technical failure. The country's transport minister, however, has submitted his resignation, saying he took responsibility for the state's, quote, long-standing failures to fix a system of railways he says were not fit for the 21st century. Hellenic train data shows the passenger train carried more than 300 passengers and 10 crew, with two crew on the cargo train. A fire brigade official said 66 of those injured were hospitalized, with at least six in intensive care. Hundreds of schoolgirls in several cities in Iran have been mysteriously poisoned in the past three months, causing a wave of anger and confusion across the country. It all started in late November in the holy city of Qom, south of the Tehran, when about 50 female students fell ill and had to be transported to the hospital. Schoolgirls in Iran are being poisoned and taken to hospital. Hundreds of cases have been reported since November in cities across the country. 
They're suffering from the same symptoms, respiratory problems, nausea, dizziness and fatigue. We were in the courtyard when all of a sudden there was a really strong smell. I started having a headache and my nose began to sting. There was a smell of gas, all of a sudden everything went black in front of me. I became really dizzy. The poisonings have mainly been reported in the city of Qom, which is home to the religious leadership that forms the backbone of the Islamic Republic. But girls have also been targeted in at least five other cities. Under pressure from concerned parents, authorities launched a criminal investigation. And on Sunday, the deputy health minister confirmed the poisonings had been deliberate, but without giving further details. There have so far been no arrests linked to the attacks. Some Iranians have speculated that the girls are being poisoned as revenge for their important role in protests that have rocked Iran since last September. Others have said it is the work of religious hardliners who want to instill fear in parents so they stop sending their girls to school. On social media, the response has been defiant. Iranians have posted these symbolic images of young girls wearing gas masks so they can continue learning. We have some good news for you. The future of herbicides are here and they are not what would expect at the failure of countless chemicals designed to cull in vision plant population. Scientists are now approaching the problem with a special solution, bugs. What you're looking at is not a field or grasslands or a forest. These are the waters of South Africa's Hartbeersport Dam. They're blanketed in water hyacinth, an invasive species that experts say is indicative of a wider problem. Professor of Botany Julie Kutzia is the deputy director of the Rhodes University Centre for Biological Control. So a system like Hardebeersport Dam is probably one of the most polluted systems in, in South Africa, potentially Africa, in that the amount of nitrates and phosphates in the water are higher than anywhere else and they are coming from upstream. Kutzia attributes the pollution to sewage, industrial chemicals, heavy metals and litter flowing from the cities of Johannesburg and Pretoria. Nutrients in those pollutants act as a perfect fertiliser on which the water hyacinth thrives. At Hartbeersport, they're also threatening to choke off livelihoods. In the last month, it has closed the business down. Dion Mostert owns Harty's Boat Company. As you can see, the boats are standing, they aren't going anywhere, there's no passengers, um, it's affecting tourism in our town, it's, it's affecting tourist jobs. We are on the verge of letting 25 staff go. Mostert says he is considering using herbicides, but admits it would only be a quick fix. However, there is another way. This is Megamalus scutellaris. The tiny insect is the natural enemy of the water hyacinth. Professor Kutzia says they are mass reared at a Rhodes University facility and released in their thousands every week. And suddenly the plant started to die and sink, something we've never seen before um, in South Africa. She says the bugs have, in previous seasons, reduced the water hyacinth infestation by 95%. Environmental Education Officer Patrick Gander rears Megamalus at the Hootvale Blazebork Sprite Wetland Conservancy. It was once home to more than 100 species of birds. Now he says there are just two or three, after 60% of the surface area got covered in plants. Like Kutzia, he says there's a wider issue at play. On, the, on, on one side, we're removing the water hyacinth manually. On the other side, the so rich spillages, the chemicals inside the water are promoting the probe, so it's like we're going in reverse. Gander and Kutzia warn that while the insects have been fairly successful in controlling the situation, they only treat the symptoms of the much larger problem. They'd like to see measures such as tightening regulations on the release of sewage and industrial effluent into water bodies. The authorities need to do more, they say, to deal with the root cause.
Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Elon Musk's rocket company SpaceX launched a four-man crew to orbit to en route in the International Space Station with the Russian cosmonaut and United Arab Emirates astronaut joining two NASA crewmates for the flight. Tesla Inc. will cut assembly costs by half of future generations of cars, engineers told investors, but Chief Executive Elon Musk did not unveil a much-awaited small, affordable electric vehicle. The two planets Jupiter and Venus appear to pass just half a degree from each other, the width of an outstretched finger held up to the sky. Venus moved high in the sky and Jupiter was closer to the horizon. The planets appearing close enough that some scientists call it a kiss. Drug giant Eli Lilly was announcing a $35 cap on the monthly cost patients phase 2 insulin in the United States, responding to outcry over the soaring costs of the diabetes medicines. Britain's Royal Navy said that it had seized Iranian weapons, including anti-tank guided missiles, last month from a smuggler's vessel in international waters in the Gulf of Oman. Britain said that the vessel was detected travelling south from the Iran at high speed during the hours of darkness by the unnamed US intelligence surveillance and resonance plane and was also tracked by a British helicopter. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end up tonight's rendition of World News in Alaska, where the heavens have opened up to display colorful waves that occur when the rays of the sun meet the Earth's atmosphere. Stay safe and have a good night.